Hello, everyone. I am excited to have this conversation with Dr. Joyce Garrett. She is a living legend and, in my opinion, a national treasure. She's a music educator. She is a phenomenal musician, choir director, minister of music, dedicated wife and mother. And she is a woman of God who has released her first book entitled Excellence Without Excuses. Stay tuned. We're going to have a great conversation today right after this. Hello, everyone. I am here with the legendary icon, uh, Dr. Joyce Garrett. Uh, Dr. Garrett, um, it is a pleasure to have you here with us. And thank you so much for agreeing to do uh, this interview. And we are excited about your new book, Excellence Without Excuses. First of all, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm really blessed. <laughs> doing well. That's good. That's good. Um, was this book in the making for a long time? I had thought about writing a book because I kept saying, this is an amazing story. Mm -hmm. This is like a miraculous story. But I had not done anything to start writing it. And then one day I was doing a session. I think it was in June of 2019. I was doing a session with the documentary filmmaker, Malkia Lydia, mm -hmm. who... Uh, was interested in the story and has started a documentary based on the reunion we had in 2018. Yeah. So I was at Sumner Museum talking on a, like a little panel, Malkia and myself. And we talked about Eastern. There were some students there. There were some people there that knew about the story. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, this woman came up to me and said, you need to write a book. Mm. And she had already written a book. Uh, her name was Marion Woodfork Simmons. So in another week, she was at my house. We were talking about it, and we decided to do it. But she was a researcher. I mean, she if I had written the book on my own, I don't know where I would have started. I think I would have just been telling from the childhood on. But right. because when she came to my house, she saw all this trove of information. Because, see, I have kept from 1976, wow. I kept a folder every year mm. of all the programs I ever did, all the printed programs, everything from that school year. I wow. just started doing it. Wow. And so when she saw all that, she was like, well, we need to use all this information. So she became the person who called all the she interviewed all these people wow so that i could write and then kind of connected the story together and then i put it in my own words and we had a book but that is fun like, yeah that's phenomenal i have a museum in my house so, <laughs> uh, so the dc public library is going to get a lot of this memorabilia okay. so they've already been over and looked at it so mm -hmm. Uh, I was keeping things, not realizing that 50 years later, how valuable they would be. Wow. Wow. And you taught in the school system for 30 years, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. I so, started off at Langley Junior High School. Mm -hmm. I taught five and a half years there. I really thought I was going to stay and teach on the junior high level. I was, I got my master's at Catholic U while I was at Langley Junior High because it was just five minutes away. Mm -hmm. So after school, I would go down there, take my classes on Saturdays and uh, in the summers to get my master's degree. And when at the time, and I, it may be like that now, you had to have a master's degree to teach on the high school level in Washington. Mm -hmm. So I figured once I got it, if something opened up, I could, you know, be qualified to accept it. I'll get right. it. Right. So sure enough, uh, I got a call from Hortense Taylor, who was the music supervisor, 
there's an opening at Eastern High School. Would you like to take it? And mm -hmm. I said, yes. And the main thing I remember, I was like, oh, that's that pretty school I've seen. <laughs> Looks like a castle. Uh -huh. I was a happy camper to go to Eastern High School. I really was. And and so you, you take the job at Eastern High School. You walk through these doors. When do you start to get a vision about what – Eastern high school choir or music program could be? Yes. Well, teaching junior high, I knew mainly it was soprano, alto, and baritone. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted this SATB choir. Mm -hmm. I wanted a choir that sounded like the high school choirs that I heard growing up in North Carolina. So mm -hmm. in my hometown, Kinston, North Carolina, since it was segregated, all the black students went to one high school. Mm. So that means you got all of the talent. All of it. All of it from the whole <laughs> town was in that one school. So I had heard <laughs> these wonderful choirs and I wanted that. So high school was going to allow me to do that. But then yeah. when I got there, all they wanted to do was sing gospel because mm -hmm. this was at the beginning of the, uh, it was like Black Power Movement, early right. 70s, and the high schools had just started having gospel choirs. Mm -hmm. And it's still revolutionary, you remember. Right. How revolutionary it was You, uh, for a, a educational institution to be doing gospel music. Right, right. So when I went, it was like a love fest. And I write about that in the book, how they were so happy to have a teacher that loved gospel like they loved gospel. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I'm not going to just do gospel. I want to do all of it. Right, right. But I used the gospel as bait mm -hmm. to get them in the choir. Mm -hmm. And I worked with the gospel choir and little by little attracted enough students to really have a concert choir. But it took a while. It always oh, takes a while. Doesn't it take a while? <laughs> it's not overnight. And you build brick by brick. That's right. That's exactly right. Did you ever find yourself going in the hallway trying to trying to find the, the most talented, the talented kids? Yeah, and like, you that's need to come how on I, found, the choir? Mm -hmm. I found a lot of them like that. Mm -hmm. I could hear somebody speaking. I would say, you sound like you could sing. I'd mm -hmm. be out in the hallway <laughs> and, and boys with deep, booming voices. You hear that voice you have? That speaking voice, you can sing. And I would invite them to come observe. I wouldn't say come join the choir. I would say come by and observe. And mm -hmm. sometimes the secret was getting the most popular kids in the school. That's correct. Isn't that it? You know. <laughs> you get So I would go to the football coach. I uh -huh. said, when football season is over, I want your guys. I want mm -hmm. these guys. And I would get a few football uh, players, and they would be the popular guys in school. Because to me, once I realized that teenagers like to be in the in crowd, then mm. I had to make the choir the end thing. Right. Now, by the time I left in 99, or, and I kept working with the choir until about 2006, by the 2000s, and even now, it, singing was not as in, for, especially for young men, as it was then. Right. So, but then when I got those football players in there, the most wonderful kids were joining the choir. They were so much fun to be around. Mm. I mean, they kept something going all the time. I just, I was just fascinated with these students. And I think that is, that was my motivation to do more and more with them. So how did the after school program begin Excellence Without Excuses? Yes. So Excellence Without Excuses began after we returned from Europe mm -hmm. in earnest. But, you know, there are students that graduated in the 70s and said to me, Miss Garrett, I remember when you said that to us. I don't remember saying it that early. Mm. But they said that I, evidently I was speaking that truth of being excellent and not giving excuses right. for what you don't do. Mm -hmm. I must have been saying it earlier. So I really put it in stone after we returned from Europe mm -hmm. because I noticed that that 
they were giving me a lot of excuses. So one day I got tired of excuses and just went up and wrote it on the chalkboard, excellence without excuses. Other mm -hmm. people have said those same words, excellence with no excuses. I've seen all kinds, but I didn't talk to anybody. It was just something that I just was fed up that day mm -hmm. and went up there and wrote that on the board. And then I got to the place where I wouldn't say it. I would just point. <laughs> <laughs> I just just point, point up there. But it came after, in the 80s, the two gospel competitions in New York. Mm -hmm. It really got started, that whole idea of decorum and standards in what you do. I couldn't understand why black choirs were singing their own music any kind of way. Mm -hmm. And if it was Beethoven or Mozart, they were singing that in another way. Mm -hmm. So to me, I wanted a choir that could do all of it. You should say 360 degrees of music. So mm -hmm. part of that was to teach stage presence and stage decorum for all mm -hmm. kinds of music, not just classical music. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. a lot of things that we achieved came out of that foundation. Mm -hmm. That's that's a very good approach. And and before we get even deeper into the after school program, um, during my tenure teaching choir, you you, you kind of become uh, you know like the football coach, like you like do. because you become the catalyst for the other classes and their achievement and and all, all throughout the school. Exactly, you do because uh, just like as a coach, the mm -hmm. things you learn on the football field, the things you learn in choir coming every day. Are, are the values that you can use in any subject, mm -hmm. in any subject. And that was basically what I was all about, trying to teach teamwork, dependability, the value of uh, being on time, the value of high achievement. Because mm -hmm. one day I was sitting in the auditorium, and we were at an assembly program at Eastern, and I noticed that anybody that went on the stage and started giggling or forgot what they had to say. They got all this applause. Everybody, the whole auditorium just applauded mm. and laughed, of course. Mm -hmm. But if somebody went up there and spoke uh, in an articulate manner and, you know, somebody that was really representing the school well, mm -hmm. they would sit, kind of put their arms like this, sit like that. And mm. I remember turning around to my students and said, clap. Clap. That was good. That was excellent. They didn't have, they did not value excellence. They didn't have uh, a frame of reference. They, was, they had, exactly. Yeah. They yeah. thought that a person that spoke well, they, they weren't, remember, remember what I said? They want the in crowd. You're right, not right. in, in some situations, in some environments, if you act like that. You're more in if, if you're a part of the pack. So right. I had to break that whole pack mentality. My goal was I couldn't change the world, but maybe I could change the atmosphere and the environment in this one room, 300. And that's mm -hmm. where it started. It was like, once you come in here, I would just point, no excuses. And I put all these educate, put all these motivational signs all over the wall. And I would just point to them. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, I'll never forget, it said, one of life's greatest disappointments or something is finding yourself unprepared. And I remember that because even in college, that's the worst feeling of all. If you, yes. they call on you to say something and you are unprepared. You didn't read what you had to read. Mm -hmm. Or at Bennett, I remember staying up all night long to finish a paper because it was due the next day. And the whole idea was you have to do whatever you have to do to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You don't go in the room and say, I have an excuse for why I didn't turn my paper in. No right. excuses. So that's where I'm getting a, a lot of that from, just upbringing. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. And so you start this after school program. How, how do you find how do you find the resources to travel and 
and and and participate mm-hmm. in these in these programs so competitions yes the resources for going to new york we would announce that the students would have to raise money actually some of them say if they had to raise three hundred dollars for new york they would have a, a patron list remember the old patron list and most people would give you a dollar Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. they could raise money like that. We sold all kind of products. We had all kind of bake sales, but not for Europe because you don't make enough money. Sometimes the parents would have a dinner, but mm-hmm. that's a, a, at a different time. We could do that to raise enough money, but we had to raise the money once we returned from Europe and formed the the Eastern Core Society nonprofit. Then we were able to get larger sums of money from foundations or groups or businesses. Yeah. And that's and how, then because, you, go ahead. No, 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 I'm sorry. That's how we went on so many college tours because we had to support AT&T. We might have had to support uh, uh, other, Fannie Mae, when we did the Kennedy Center concert, they bought a whole bunch of tickets. I mean, it was people, we had an executive director by then, who could write grants for us. So by the mid to late 90s, that was the peak of our success, for getting the the resources we needed and getting the support we needed. Yeah. And you, um, you, you your um, ideas and your implementation of discipline, excellence without, excellence without excuses, uh, I played a big. I know it played a big role in you all doing these national televised programs. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, what I was trying to teach them was that their world was bigger than Room Three Hundred, mm-hmm. and I never wanted the choir to be the highlight of their lives. So I, I noticed that a lot of times they were not in order. So Mm -hmm. when you are laughing and giggling in the middle of a rehearsal that is important, you're out of order. It was just Mm -hmm. things. They were never hostile. They just went in in order. Mm -hmm. Didn't know when to say what. When uh, when we were going to Europe, we had the ambassador from uh, Austria. We had no, not the ambassador. We had someone from the embassy to come talk to the students, and there was so much giggling and talking and asking crazy questions that day. To me, they needed to understand when to do what, when to say what. They just one day I looked out the window and I just said, "The moon is in order. The sun is in order." Mm-hmm. But you are out of order, and until <laughs> you get some kind of order in your life, you're not going to be successful. Because my mm-hmm. whole thing was, how do we launch them into success? Mm-hmm. And so many were out of order. They, no matter how much they would have wanted to do that, they could not because they didn't have the values needed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's just so important, and, and, and you are demonstrating this now, even in our conversation. It's just so insp- it's, so, it's so important to, I guess, for lack of a better term, speak life into people, and to let them know that they can do it, that they can rise to this level of expectation. Exactly. Regardless of where you come from. Exactly, and and regardless of what peop- the uh, boxes people have put you in, mm-hmm. I know two of my students who were in special education back mm-hmm. in the day, basically that was just a mimograph piece of paper. You go to class, fill out some real simple something. Mm-hmm. And I remember I had a parent named Pat Cooper mm-hmm. who worked alongside me. Her son was one of those children. I think about the ninth or 10th grade, she came up to that school. She says, I am not letting you stay in this program. I want you to be mainstream. I want you to learn just like everybody else. That person, you should see how he writes now. Mm. I mean, his writing is exemplary. Mm. Uh, I have another student who is in special ed who is now working as Dr. Sylvette Walker Mm. at the 
State Board of Education in D.C. Mm. It was just people had given up on them. Mm -hmm. And and we, through that Excellence Without Excuses program, kind of opened their minds to, oh, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can do this. And I think all that television exposure uh, was another way of letting them see these people are just like me. These teenage, they had these teenage stars, you know, like Christina Aguilera. She's right, right, she right. She was in Christmas in Washington. She was seventeen years old. They could see these young people, and they said they began to think, you know, I could do that. Right. I can be that. And I think all of that exposure and that constant in the choir room, not accepting excuses, it finally started seeping into their minds. Right, right. So this book, Excellence Without Excuses, is currently on Amazon, but you have a national release on October the 14th. Yes, and, uh, it's right now the book is on my website, joycegarrett.com. You can purchase it there. It will be for national and international distribution on October 14th. That's where you can get it on Amazon. Amazon will have this soft cover I have here, mm-hmm. the hard cover, and the ebook. All will be available on October the 14th. Gotcha. But uh, there are lots of great pictures. I have pictures from my childhood <laughs> all the way through college. My mother's picture, my father's picture. Wow. A lot of choir pictures, a lot of different mm-hmm. pictures of different choirs. Uh, pictures from 1988 when we went to Vienna mm-hmm. uh, at the White House, singing at the White House. This is the official picture that was taken as soon as we finished singing in Vienna in 1988. And then after that, so many things. Here's a picture with uh, President Bush. Here's a picture. One of our students was on the cover of Scholastic Magazine. Hmm. So many pictures. Here's a picture when I got honorary doctorate at West Virginia Wesleyan College. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know we remember Robin Sugar Williams. Robin is here singing in the Netherlands, when we went to the Netherlands for the Danny K International Children's Award. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then I have more text, and then back in the back, I have another whole section of pictures. Now, these pictures are um, later, but they are a lot from Christmas in Washington pictures, Ford's Theater. These pictures are some of the students in the 90s, mm-hmm. and I'm continuing. Here's a good picture from Christmas in Washington. Mm. Back in the day when we were the only choir singing. But you wow. know, when when the show went from NBC to uh T went from NBC to TNT, mm-hmm. they asked for a diverse choir. Mm. So that's when I I'm like, how can I get a diverse choir? Oh, I know Everett Williams, who is mm. teaching at uh, Bethesda uh, Walker Johnson High mm-hmm. School in Bethesda. And so I got his kids in and we all mixed up. And then they became part of the choir for the the other remaining times I was there. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. But this was special because this was us. Remember, everybody would be in front of the TV. It's so exciting. Easton's coming on. Easton's coming on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember watching and then it. And it was... changed. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I and had you know... Go ahead. You've, you've taught so many great young people. Um, yeah. It's just been amazing. I, I'm not sure if you know the story be- between me and Robin. No. Okay, so I met Robin. Uh, I was, she just lost the finals of Star Search. And not too long after that, somehow we got hooked up. And I played for her for many years before she got to Easter. My goodness. And of, and of course, you know when I was when I was when I was teaching at Johnson Junior High School, I had this young impressionable man, young man named Cofield Williams. Yes, yes. He's and he said, "I'm going me. to Eastern." I said, "Well, you are on your way." Yes. And you <laughs> sent me some good ones. You said, "What was your you, you were at Johnson Junior High, Stanton Road, Junior. Southeast Washington." Yes. Indeed. You're just a few. It was during your last bit because I didn't get into the school system until ninety three, ninety four. Right. But you saw the talent. The oh, talent yes. was there. Oh. I never went out and recruited. Very mm. seldom did I ever recruit. It was like 
the young man that I was talking about earlier that uh, writes so well now that they had in special ed, mm -hmm. he said when he was six years old and he saw his older siblings in the choir, he said, then I'm coming to Eastern. Mm -hmm. I have Roderick Giles, who is this amazing musician. Now. Right. Roderick, I met him when he was 14 years old. Mm. He had come to Eastern to bring his uh, credentials because he wanted to to come to Eastern, but he had been sent his papers had been sent to another school. Mm -hmm. So he came that day. That he, he told the secretary, "I want to be in the choir." She said, "Well, there's Miss Miss the choir teacher's right there." I had just walked in the office mm. in the middle of the summer. Just so happened. I said, come here, young man, let me hear you sing. I took him on the window seal in the mm -hmm. hall. <laughs> and look at what he's doing now. So I had brought That's amazing. Down. It's been so many. Uh, the One of my students, Marquise Moss, graduated in 95. He's been Simba in the Lion King all over the world. <laughs> I just can't imagine. And that young man, I walked to the window one day and said, you you got to see beyond these projects right here. This is a great big old world out there. Mm -hmm. And But I don't remember saying it, but he says that that's kind of something that kind of got him started. And then when he went to the Netherlands and performed on that big stage, you know, if you get, if that's what you really want to do inside, when you have an experience like that, it kind of cements it in your mind. Right. right. And so now he's doing his thing. Yana mm -hmm. Crawley, mm -hmm. amazing that won a BT Sunday Best. I just, there has been a steady, Tawanda Reinhardt, yep. Darlene Simmons, and, and Philip. It, it would be funny. I would just be in my class. They would come running in. Darlene's here. Darlene's here. <laughs> Yana's here. Yana's here. They would just come and tell me that one of these fabulous singers from the area had enrolled in Eastern. It was wow, that's, in the that's all you needed to hear. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> that's all I needed to hear. It was, those were some amazing years mm. with some amazing singers. And they can still sing. Oh, my, I, 100%. I, I yeah. produced uh, Tawana's um, single. Yeah, uh, is she, that right? Yeah, me and Marcus Johnson. I was, I could see my, in my opinion, I had gone to see the Wiz on Broadway. I'm going to see all these shows, Ain't Misbehavior. And I was, I kept saying, that's Tw Twana can out sing all these people. Uh, all of them. <laughs> and, and she, exactly, all of them. And she is still singing. Yeah. I had Taiwan Bradford, who's mm -hmm. always my assistant director. Yep. James Cunningham was always my drummer. Mm -hmm. And they're still working with me today. Yeah, that's, but, that's a blessing. I mean, some talent came through there. It would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, concert choir. <laughs> Friday was gospel day. Mm -hmm. And I mean, people from the neighborhood would come in and sit in the back. Mm. And as soon as I would say, I need some fellas to go to the elevator to help James bring up the drums. Oh, you could just see their faces it light gone. up. They was gone. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, it's gospel day. <laughs> Oh, so I'm glad I, I credit my background in North Carolina and coming up with that traditional Roberta Martin gospel mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and and loving gospel mm -hmm. and then getting here and hearing a sound like I had never heard before. I had never heard people sing like they sang here. That mm -hmm. brassy sound, that just flat out chest for it. And I was fascinated with that. And mm -hmm. so... My students were carrying me along. I would mm -hmm. pick some some of the songs, and Taiwan would pick the other. Mm -hmm. George, they would come to me. George, you gotta learn this. You got. Have you heard "Changed"? Somebody mm -hmm. called me up one night. Have you heard "Changed"? <laughs> <laughs> have you heard this? Have you? Heard, it was like that all the time. Have you heard "Riches"? Mm -hmm. Your love divine. Mm -hmm. That's then Shelton back to my cousin. He was writing music for us, and it was like, we gotta sing this. We got. As soon as he would write it, I'd be like, I, I got to teach you Eastern. Mm -hmm. so we had, we just enjoyed doing it. And so I think all those other things, the TV shows, everything, that was just icing on the cake. 
It was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was. It was what you did every day. Yeah, it was. It was what yeah. we did yeah. every day. So everybody, if, if, if those of y'all that, that watch this interview, go pick up the book. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll be blessed. And so, uh, somebody told me something that I would never forget yes. that will cause me to write my biography. And uh, they told me, and I'm glad. So that's why I'm glad you wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Somebody said, I can't remember who said it, but they said. An obituary is what others say about you. That's right. That's and right. A biography is what you get to say about yourself. So you get to tell about your own what story. You get. I love that. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. And so, it's, it's such an amazing, unbelievable story how mm-hmm. these so called inner city children and young adults, young people, are teens could achieve on a world-class level mm-hmm. and sustain that year after year, after year, after year, after year, and then use that to launch their own careers and lives as good citizens and moms and dads. And you would be surprised how many people to this day call and say how that whole philosophy of excellence without excuses has impacted their lives and now mm. they're passing it on to their children that's amazing mm-hmm. it is it you really sit back is. and think about it just like wow i know i know <laughs> i know i know it now, is in 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 our last few minutes mm-hmm. you've actually you're like a double agent <laughs> because you not only led a successful career in um in in, in as an educator mm-hmm. but you led you've you have led one of the most successful churches in america Yes. And mm-hmm. I just, that's phenomenal. That is something that, you know, that, that only 1% of people I know can say. Mm-hmm. How did you balance it out? Yeah. And the third part of that is rearing two children. You're triple agent. <laughs> and triple, triple agent. And, and quadruple agent. And play and direct the Naval Academy Choir for 17 wow. years. Wow. And when I look back at, at it now, I don't know how. But I've always had a separation between my career and anything I was doing outside that. Mm -hmm. So at church, even I was telling uh, Taiwan just yesterday that I did not leave Eastern and immediately bring my great singers to my church. Mm -hmm. I always kind of separated what I did there Mm -hmm. and what I did over here. Right. But the good thing about Alfred Street was Alfred Street had a, a a culture of excellence before I got there. Okay. So see when it's the culture right. of doing so I remember talking to someone a few years ago and they said, Well, you know, our choir members they come and they come in the choir off about quarter off. And between quarter off and time it starts. I said, You all don't get together and warm up uh, practice anything? No. You just come mm-hmm. in the crowd lot. And we practice like one week before we sing. Like if I'm sing that week, I practice maybe that Monday, that Tuesday. So I thought about that and I said, it's good when people can do that, but can you imagine how much more excellent something is if you practice every week? Mm-hmm. Like if you practice just two times a month and not mm-hmm. one time a month. So the more you do, so when I got there, the choirs already rehearsed every week. When I got there, I remember if membership group number one was leading prayer meeting, I would notice that it would be like somebody went way above beyond what was necessary. Mm-hmm. It would be like, if I had to present a five-minute presentation, it would be like a PhD presentation. Mm. It's just the culture. Our church has a culture of above and beyond. And even Pastor Wesley, one of his things that he says to the staff, I want you to walk on water. I want you to go above and beyond. Mm. So everybody has that whole, if you're given an assignment, it's never, I'm going to just do as little as possible. It's always excellent. So when I got there, it was like that, and we just continued. And then with with him, it's the same way. 
It's mm-hmm. the culture. And, and culture is a is is a is a big word because um, I was at a conference this summer and um, a cohort of mine, Meacham Lamar Clark, who's a very talented young I man. I know Meacham. Uh huh. Meacham did a presentation on culture, which mm-hmm. he he really just defined the difference in mm-hmm. our, our worship experiences. Um, and a lot of us don't know how because we have not defined our culture. Yes, we can't right. be excellent in it. Uh, you know, so th- that was so. You, you what you're saying is right on time. In a vacuum, because the people will, they will revolt in a way mm-hmm. if the, uh, until you get the culture. You know, right? You can't, you can't go in and say, "I want, I don't want ripped jeans. I don't want you to wear that. I want mm-hmm. you to wear this." Why? You got to hear, you got to have wise and always mm-hmm. did it this way. You're going to hear that for a while. It's not instant. You mm-hmm. have to develop the culture. Mm-hmm. And anybody that walks into a culture of excellence, you're already ahead of the game. Because mm-hmm. when you have to change culture, that's hard. Until you get, I remember, here's a good example. When I went to the Naval Academy, I had just started doing TV and I was aware of how important it was for people to smile as they're singing. Mm -hmm. Because the first year we sang at Christmas, they had a sign up in the back. It says, smile or die. That's because we weren't used to smiling while we sing. That's hard to do. I mean, you had to, you got to intend to do that. Right. So uh, I went over to Naval Academy thinking I was going to get them to hear these uh, formal military people. Right. And sure enough, that first year, the president of the choir said to me, ma'am, we don't feel comfortable doing that. Because remember, once his whole class graduated, that class, that was seniors, mm-hmm. then the juniors graduated, then the fr- by the fourth year, I was developing a culture mm-hmm. Where you smile and you have personality when you sing, you mm-hmm. have to get move out the people that are not wanting to do it because they right. want to do what they've been doing. Right. And little by little, that's why it takes time. And yeah. sure enough, uh, in four or five years, when they walked in, they knew that they would have to smile and give more personality than it, they were given before. It was a part of the culture. It's a part of the culture. You could teach a whole workshop. The place or the city ought to just be packed, auditorium. Because <laughs> yeah, pastors yeah, need it, especially young pastors. They need it. They need to. In yeah. a lot of these churches that you know, where you see all the the smokes and smoke and lights, that's a part of a culture. Yes, they're creating exactly. something. They're creating something. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, I just congratulate you. You know, we we talked mm-hmm. offline, and 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 you're getting ready to to wind up your tenure at Alpha Street. And yes, how many years I, has that been? I've been doing music at Alpha Street for 45 years since 1979. That's amazing. When I got the right hand of fellowship, I had on the choir robe. I was already working, <laughs> <laughs> and been working ever since. 45 years. I've directed the teen choir. Mm-hmm. I've directed the young adult choir. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is now called Psalms of Praise. And mm. now I'm directing Trinity, which mm. was called Senior Choir. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things I did when I joined, uh, became director, I said, we're going to change this name. We are not, because a lot of right. people I want to sing in the choir, but I don't want to sing in the senior choir. Uh-huh, so I changed uh-huh. the name. We changed the name and we kept moving forward. And so it's been 45 great years. The, what makes culture is leadership that believes in excellence. Right. And then the people that you're leading have to believe in excellence. Right. So I was just lucky enough to get in that kind of culture over mm-hmm. there where I, because I believe in excellence. I, growing up in, in North Carolina, my aunts raised me and it was like, go back in that kitchen and clean that table better than you did. Mm -hmm. Go back in there and wash and iron that pillowcase like it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Go back in there and you better <laughs> fix, you better clean that bathroom sink. I mean, it was like everything you had to do. And then you go to school mm-hmm. and the teachers are saying, oh, you know, back then everything, you're representing the race. You're represent mm-hmm. uh don't 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 be giving me this paper with all these erasures in it. Go back and do this over. Mm-hmm. So it gets in you. So I think my culture of excellence, everything that I'm teaching to people now, it got in me early. And mm-hmm. it's just a part of me. Well, last few moments, I'm going to ask you some uh, um, mm-hmm. some rapid fire questions okay, I, like, I, like, fire. I, I like to ask. Uh, okay. um, favorite time of the year? Fall. Mine too. <laughs> Don't you just love it? And fall is so pretty up here. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Favorite color? Rose and fuchsia, those kind of warm colors like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about food? Food, uh, collards are my favorite vegetable. And it might be my favorite food. My grandmother could just fix collards. So I love collards. Well, you know, I, I love I, vegetables. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We both love him. So uh, do you have a, a all time favorite him or do you have a favorite him of the week? You know, kind of more like of the week. One mm-hmm. time, my favorite hymn was Greatest Thy Faithfulness. Even mm-hmm. though I never sang it growing up. Very seldom we would sing it at our wow. church. Mm-hmm. But Greatest Thy Faithfulness is not so easy to sing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's an easy hymn to sing. No. So I really like uh, To God Be the Glory. Great things he has yes, done. Yes, Lord. That's one of I my favorites. I love favorite. that second verse. Who yielded his son. I, I know. Who Val, what does that second verse? Um, oh, prayer for redemption, the purchase of God. The vilest offender mm-hmm. who truly believes one moment from Jesus, a pardon received. I just love those lyrics. It's just yeah. Good, the text. Yeah, yeah. And and last question: How did you, as far as church ministry is concerned, um? How did you stay relevant? And, I'm, and, I'm, and I preface that because I was on my way to church about a month ago. Mm-hmm. Sometime I listened to the 730 service. Yeah. And you were directing God wants a yes. Yeah. And I heard it and I was like, and you know, my young mind, I was like, that must be Thor. Yep, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I saw that little lady sitting up there. I said, that's Miss Garrett up there. <laughs> One of my f- Favorite gospel songs. Isn't it I well love put together? That song. <laughs> and, you know, when I see what Patrick Lundy does with the ministers of music, mm-hmm. when I would watch him, I would say, So this choir that I have at Alva Street with these concert type voices, concert mm-hmm. choir voices, they could sing anything too. Yes, so they can. So what I'm finding out is they can sing anything. They don't sing it with the same brassy voice that the young adults would sing it at, mm-hmm. but they can still sing it and, and it enjoy was, it. Yeah, it was great. I was uh, in the car yeah, just having, having church. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, the, the secret is the older you get, always be around younger people. That's correct. You That's got correct. Because they they have the energy. They, they come with the new ideas. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have in our choir a mixture of the young and the old. Mm-hmm. And so... The young people are getting used to the anthems that the older people have all been singing. And then we can learn from the yeah. James Halls and those kind of songs. And old people don't, and, and, and old and the seasoned saints don't have to push so hard when they got young people doing this. You can, they can balance themselves. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You always, you always got to bring in younger. That's one of the reasons that I felt it was time to leave my duties at Alpha Street. Mm. It's my church that I dearly love. I still hope to be there and if, if they need a substitute to do mm-hmm. something or I may play a prelude sometimes, mm-hmm. just be there. But at a certain point you need to pass the baton mm-hmm. to to some to the next generation and let mm-hmm. them do what they do. Mm-hmm. Well I'm I'm praying and hoping for much success with your book many other avenues and, and, and lanes praying that they will open for you as, as you continue to tell your story. I appreciate it so much. And this, this book uh, is going to be available in the, this is the one most people get. This is a, a softback mm-hmm. 
with all the pictures are black and white. Mm -hmm. Then they, you can get a hardback color, mm -hmm. or you can get an ebook. But all mm -hmm. be available on Amazon and any other place on October fourteenth. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you. You're one of my biggest fans. I'm one oh, of your oh, biggest no, fans. I, 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 I believe me, you're one of my. All the things that you've been doing to just connect us together to keep oh. the music community not. It first began here, but I think it's mm -hmm. global now. Just keep us yeah. connected. And I congratulate you on everything you're doing. I appreciate Dr. Garrett and and thank your son uh, for for helping out and your husband's never too far behind. No, he's always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And your daughter Melanie, I didn't with know who, how to hook this up. <laughs> and your daughter, with whom I grew up with, That's that was right, the Garrett Melanie. that I knew. Yeah. Uh, please extend her my regards. I will. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey everybody, this is Philip Carter and with over 30 years of music ministry experience and in the gospel music industry, I still get excited about music workshops. Yeah, I get excited about training people and helping churches to grow, helping people to grow. And you know what? Many of our churches have taken music education out of our budgets. We've taken it away from our people and we need to put it back in because with education and with training, I mean, your people can rise to another level. Everybody can't afford to pay for the big names and the greatest singers that come in our churches. So we have to work with what who God has given us. And so please consider a workshop. It doesn't cost as much as you think. But if you want to grow your music ministry 2024 and in 2025, consider doing a music workshop. Contact us today. It won't be as much as you think, but it'll be a great investment for your music ministry. Here's just some of the topics that we cover. How to revive a declining music ministry, vocal technique and vocal care, bands, uh, band members, do's and don'ts. That really means musician do's and don'ts. Uh, audio visual tips and question and answer session and the power of medleys, how to incorporate hymns, how to use hymns differently on what is praise and worship what is the role of choir and music ministry there's so much that we offer that you can take advantage of contact us today at rufus59 at yahoo.com that is rufus59 at yahoo.com and we'll be glad to help you out let's thrive going into 2025 Hey everybody, check out my brand new hymns masterclass. If you want to know what a hymn is, if you want to know why hymns are important, you want to know, you want to get real life solutions on how to reintegrate hymns back into your worship experience. Or perhaps you are a beginner or intermediate musician and you want to learn how to embellish hymns better. Check out the hymns masterclass. Perhaps you are a well advanced musician, but you didn't grow up singing hymns or playing hymns. This class can help you as well because I can teach you how to embellish hymns without losing the melody. Check out the Hymns Masterclass, all for the price of one piano lesson. Go now to www.bygospel.com and check it out. Thank you for watching Real Talk with Philip Carter. We invite you to check out all of our various programming on our social media pages.